This is the postgraduate pediatric orthopedic video series. And I'm Satal Ashraida, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. In this video, I'll take you through how I do open reduction of a dislocated hip in a child. Let's have this case study. A five-year-old boy presented with bilateral hip dislocation. He's otherwise fit and healthy. This is his x-ray, which showed bilateral high dislocation of both hips. Here, I think it's worth showing a few signs. The hyperlordosis associated with bilateral dislocated hip, the classic sign, uh, a line drawn from the greater trochanter through the anterior superior spine, should go at the belly button or above the belly button. But when the hips are dislocated, you can see these lines go below the belly button because the greater trochanter is high. Also, you can notice the typical waddling gait the children do exhibit. Uh, in theater, I position my patient's supine on table, radiolucent table, and I put a sandbag underneath the lower part of the chest and the spine, away from the buttock, so it allows the uh, buttock muscle to fall back uh, during the incision and dissection. Uh, I usually seal my surgical field with a sticky uh, draping, then I start the preparation from the foot uh, upward. I usually use uh, chlorhexidine. Uh, there's evidence to say it is superior to betadine and I usually use two preparation one before the draping and one after the draping and this is the one before uh, the draping uh, I'm speeding the video here for the sake of time uh, you always can slow it down to see it at normal speed after finishing uh, the preparation with the chlorhexidine I usually use U-drape and I've tried to seek it uh, as far as my uh, surgical field. I've tried to give myself more space rather than lower space. So I need to reach most of the back of the buttock. <coughs> I need to reach uh, uh, at least two, three centimeter medial to the anterior severe iliac spine. And higher up, I really need to reach the top of the iliac crest. When I finish my draping, I use iopan strips just to seal the edges so they don't come off the skin. Uh, this is really important because often the, uh, the draping can come off the skin. Uh, and risking the contamination of the surgical field, particularly at the back here where I'm doing another layer of IOPA. And after finishing draping, I do my second uh, layer of preparation using the chlorohexidine as well. And I usually give it two to three minutes after I finish to make sure that it works. And then I mark my pony landmark. This is the anterior superior iliac spine, the iliac crest, and my incision in the groin crease. Extend from almost the top of the crest to around one centimeter to two centimeter medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. Also, I make sure that the skin can stretch over the iliac crest. Then I mark my femoral osteotomy, the front and the back of the greater trochanter, the tip of the greater trochanter. Uh, and usually my incision is that uh, more toward the posterior part of the trochanter rather than the front. And the two lines usually look uh, parallel. Uh, before you start your incision, time out is really essential. We don't want to do the uh, wrong side surgery. Uh, then I start my incision using a knife down to the fat, then I use a uh, bovi. Uh, my quarter is setting usually 2020 for both uh, cutting and diathermy. Uh, the fat needs to be stretched before you can cut it with the quarter. I reach to the next layer which is white glistening layer underneath the fat.
white la uh, the white layer I was uh, heading toward is appearing now. Again, it's really important to use the full size of your incision. Stop the bleeder as you encounter them. And my direction here is toward the iliac crest. At the back, I need to see the fold of the uh, abdominal muscles as they fold in toward the iliac crest, and I try to peel them upward and not to cut through them. Retaining uh, it can help at this stage and as you can see I slightly bended my, the tip of my uh, cautery just to help me uh, ease off or remove the uh, abdominal muscle of the iliac crest. I usually create a, a, a thin layer of the pericondrium. Uh, uh, which remain attached to the abdominal muscle but I'll try to ease it off or feather off the iliac crest and here it's really very important to reach from the anterior, anterior uh, superior iliac spine all the way back to the zenith or to the top of the iliac crest when you are close to the anterior superior iliac spine, be careful. The lateral cutaneous nerve is uh, not very far from you. But as we identify earlier, we can keep safe distance from it. Again, when I Peel the muscles of the iliac crest. I don't go all the way uh, to the other side of the iliac crest. I usually stop halfway through. So some of the muscles still attach to half of the uh, epiphysis. And then when the above completed, I'll turn my attention toward uh, the lower part of the approach. Here I'm trying to find my lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. It's really important to identify this nerve and protect it. You can see it between these two layers just start appearing in your field. I'll zoom in in a second to show it to you. And uh, you can see it glistening there just coming off the inguinal ligament. And this little green arrow pointing to where it is. So now I free it more proximal and distally so that it won't get stretched and it will be away from my uh, uh, approach. I'm just speeding the video here again. At this stage, I'll try to find my plane between the tensor fascia lata and the sartorius muscles and usually there's a very distinctive uh, dip uh, slightly distally uh, as pointed by the green arrow here usually you can feel it with your scissor or with your finger so once you identify you can ease these two muscles apart and your assistant can put his retractor there to uh, help at this stage I developed this plane fully, uh, both distally and proximally. Uh, at the floor of this uh, plane will be the rectus muscle, but at this stage I just want to see it, I don't want to dissect it yet. Uh, distally I try to reach uh, as further as I can, while proximally I'll try to expose what I call it the ridge, which is the ridge between anterior superior iliac spine and the inferior iliac spine, as pointed by the, these red arrows here. You can feel it easier with your finger or with a scissor or periosteal elevator, but you need to identify or map it from the anterior superior spine to the inferior one. 
And next we turn our attention to split the epiphysis. I usually use a 15 plate. It's really important to stay in the middle of the bone so that one side is not bigger than the other side. And the splitting has to go all the way up to the top of the iliac crest. If you split it shorter, you'll find difficulty in peeling it off the bone. Once we complete the splitting of the epiphysis, we use Brioche Elevator to peel off the two of half of the epiphysis off the iliac crust. It is really important to keep the epiphysis attached to the periosteum and to stay within the periosteum because this is our safety envelope. You can see the top part uh, where the cartilage attached to the bone can be uh, a bit more difficult to clear. But once you clear it, peeling the periosteum down to the greater sciatic notch is e relatively easily. Uh, the greater sciatic notch is behind the anterior inferior iliac spine. So as you, die, uh, as you lift the periosteum, you need to dive uh, more caudally, not just posteriorly. And when you reach the edge of the bone there, there will be another epiphysis from the other side, which needs to be peeled carefully. If a bit of patience and taking your time at that stage is really important. Now I've reached to the uh, at the edge of the bone at the great hysatic notch and here I'm really taking my time to peel the epiphysis from the other side of the bone. And once I've done that, I put two small swabs on either side of the iliac bone. This is to reduce the risk of bleeding. I turn my attention again to the lower part of the approach. Here I'm trying to develop the plane further between the tensor fascia lata and the uh, sartorius and I'm trying to find my rectus muscle. They usually lose areolar tissue covering this muscle. And you can see the lateral edge of the muscle start appearing in the view here. And I'm following the lateral border of the muscles uh, distally. Sometimes there's some loose areolar tissues around the muscles, which I try to clear. Again, going distally to find the distal part of the lateral border of the muscles, then move medially, and you can see the tendinous part of the muscle there, that white structure there. And for the sake of time, I'm speeding the video here. But what I'm trying to do here to isolate the rectus muscles uh, away from adjacent structures such as psoas muscle of the capsule so that I can hook it with my scissor in the preparations for uh, tenotomy. And here I just put my scissor underneath the muscles double checking that what I've got is the rectus muscles only and when I'm happy I use stay sutures usually number one micro here I'm using number one micro as a stay suture before I divide the tendon
time, I'm happy. I'm dividing the tendon using a 15 a blade. I divided the tendon at the common uh, junction between the straight head and reflected head. So later when I stitch it back, I kind of stitch it as uh, one tendon. Now I divide some of the muscle fiber that attached to the capsule. Make sure that's completely divided here. And the thumb I usually clear more for later uh, stitching. So I go underneath it just to divide it away from the capsule. Now I've divided the tendon, the next stage is to expose the capsule. We need at least 270 degrees exposure of the capsule, from the top, from the front, and from the medial side. Uh, the first part, usually the one under the rectus muscle, we clear off any uh, muscles attachment or any uh, remnant fibers from the rectus or from the psoas muscle. Then top, we go higher up and we clear the uh, capsule from the adjacent periosteum then laterally the top part and the front is usually easy however the medial side usually is more tricky that's why I usually leave it to the end as you can see here there's some loose areolar tissues which is divided just to have a very good view from the top of the capsule Okay, here I'm trying to try to reduce it with it uh, to find whether this has made a difference for the hip. As you can see, still the hip is not reducible. And now I'm moving to the medial side of the capsule. Uh, usually the capsule is your friend. If you stay close to the capsule, you can go very far medially. So you need to always to see the capsule under your scissor or under your knife. And here the purpose really is to develop the plane between the psoas muscles or the psoas tendon uh, and the capsule. This step needs to be uh, to take a bit of patience because there are important structures on the medial side. Unfortunately, the video angle doesn't show this uh, steps very clear, but as long as you stay to the capsule, go gradually, medially, you will you will see the uh, psoas tendon come into the view. Now you can see the psoas muscle, which is just between the retractor and the forceps there, and I'm trying to go underneath it. And my the jaw of my scissor, indeed, they are between the muscles and the capsule. So I try to, to put it further down and try to open that space. Now we are back to the normal speed uh, because we, we can cross important step here. Now you can see the psoas tendon just at the bottom of the wound. I just hooked it with my scissor. You can see there's uh, some muscle fibers with tendinous fibers. Uh, at this stage, I really want to make sure this is my psoas tendon and it is not a femoral nerve. Believe it or not, they are very close to each other. Uh, but having muscle fibers uh, blended into a uh, tendinous fibers this is confirmation it is a uh, so a standard and further i do if you peel the muscles more you can see a uh, tendon and once i'm sure it is a tendon i usually divide it with a uh, 15 plate and i divided the tendon but i leave the muscles fibers in continuity so here's my tendon 
and I divide usually over a scissor to protect and the line structure that. So here's the tendon gone. I remove my scissor and you can see the muscles there in continuity. There's the muscle fibers in continuity. Having cleared the capsule and we div uh, divided the psoas, we move to the next stage of this procedure, uh, which is capsulotomy. Here I'm putting my self retainer and pulling the rectus away from my field and I can see almost 270 degrees of the capsule. Uh, having cleared the, ca uh, the capsule and divided the psoas tendon, we move to the next stage of this procedure, uh, which is uh, the capsulotomy. I usually ask my assistant to flex the hip and push the head down. Uh, so to keep the head away from the capsule and this is reduce the risk of damaging it with the knife I'm feeling for the edge of the acetabulum because my uh, capsulotomy usually few millimeters two to three millimeter outside the rib and this is to avoid damaging the labrum In this static image I'm demonstrating the capsulotomy there's full exposure of the capsule almost 270 degrees all around it the red line is where the acetabulum rim is and marked by the, uh, by the red arrow and this is the horizontal line of the T capsulotomy and the vertical part of the T capsulotomy is pointed by the green arrow. And here, uh, I probably doing the horizontal part of the uh, capsulotomy. Unfortunately, the angle of the camera is not perfect uh, to show this step very well. Uh, I made a small hole, then I'm putting my knife the other way around to, over, to make the hole is bigger. At this stage, I usually prefer to use a scissor or sometimes I put a McDonald to protect the femoral head. See here, I'm using the scissor to complete the T the horizontal part of the T capsulotomy. Here I completed the top part of the horizontal part of the T capsulotomy and I'm turning my scissor to uh, do the bottom part now. It goes without saying that all cutting should be uh, under direct vision and there should be no blind cutting. And now here I'm doing the vertical part of the T A capsulotomy. Internal rotate the femur to get better access to the bottom part of the capsule where the capsule is attached to the uh, anterotrochantric ridge at the femur. Now after dislocating the femoral head, you can see the ligamentum teres and the view. I just divide it using a scissor and I'm still holding to the end with the uh, forceps. Uh, then I usually grasp it with a coca and try to divide it off the ligamentum teres. Uh, it is difficult to see so I use this uh, diagram here to show how this can be done. You can see the ligamentum teres and you just pass the scissors on either side of the ligamentum teres and cut off the, lig uh, off the transverse ligament. Then the next step is to clear the socket from any bulvenar or fiber fatty tissues. Uh, 
Then after clearing the socket from pulmonar, it is time to reduce the hip. And as you can see, it is reducible. And it is really stable when you internal rotate the hip for around 80 degrees. Yes, it dislocates in adduction here, but there's a lot of adduction. Again, I reduced it again. And again, when I remove the rotation as I extend it, it dislocates. So we're going to repeat the process. It is reduced. In full extension, if rotation kept is stable, full flexion is stable, abduction is stable, but when you go abduction, it dislocates. Reduce it again. Again, when you try to remove the rotation, it dislocates in full extension. And again, with the reduction, if you notice the reduction are a bit tight. So here we need to do two things. Number one, we need to slightly to shorten the femur. And number two, we need to derotate the femur. And this will be our next stage. section we will describe how to do femoral shortening and derotation osteotomy. We utilize our initial marking we did at the beginning of the surgery. Uh, we went through the skin and the fat uh, using a knife initially for the skin then cautery. Then now I'm going through the IT band using a 15 blade. Little bleeder there. Sometimes these are difficult to stop at this stage before you open the full IT band. So I'm using my scissor now, just underneath the, uh, the IT band, then divide it upwards and downward. And this will give me a better access to stop that uh, bleeder. As you divide the IT band, uh, the vastus lateralis come in the view. Uh, this approach often called subvastus approach because we don't go through the vastus, we have to lift it up. Now, as you can see, there's some personal tissue on top of the greater trochanter. This is to be cleared so that we can easily visualize the vastus lateralis. And I go proximally and uh, upward just to find where the attachment of the hip abductors, because the lower end of the attachment is uh, the mark for my incision over the vastus lateralis. Having identified the lower border of the hip abductors, I just divide the vastus lateralis at the same level of the lower border of the hip abductors, uh, all the way down to the bone. Uh, this included the uh, periosteum. And I I lift this, uh, the uh, vastus and the periosteum in one piece of the bone. Then using the uh, periosteal elevator to peel off uh, the muscles of the bone. Again, for the sake of time, I'm speeding these steps. Uh, it just takes uh, some time to peel the uh, muscles of the bone adequately. I normally use a uh, four hole plates. Here I'm trying to see whether we are, I have a, a adequate exposure. Look at it, seems to be good. Uh, so we'll get the x-ray machine uh, to have a look at the, how it looks. And the x-ray showed that really the plate sitting nicely. I put my drill uh, and I check it both on the AP and the lateral to ensure that uh, we have good uh, position that I fill the two proximal screws and I'll check them on the AP and the lateral 
Once I'm happy with them, I'll remove the plate and the screws. At this stage, I put uh, my derotation wires uh, to measure how much I'm going to rotate. This patient had uh, uh, 80 degrees of interversion, so I'm reducing by 50 degrees. Uh, back to the, my femur, you can see the, de and, uh, the derotation wire at the top of the bone and the two holes of the, uh, of the previous screws uh, there. Uh, I usually put a uh, depth measure in the distal hole, so just to give me a guide, I would not go through that uh, uh, hole because I need it later. Then I uh, use small uh, saw plate. I'll do my osteotomy just distal to the uh, distal hole, distal screw hole. Again, whenever you uh, cut a bone, you need to cool it. Otherwise, the heat generated it might cause uh, bone necrosis. Uh, because I'm planning to do shortening, uh, I make two cuts. It's easier to make the cut while the bone in continuity rather than try to take off later. Uh, it was not very tight, but it was tight enough, so I was planning to take three or four millimeter. As you can see, I put two bone levers on either side of the bone uh, to prevent uh, damaging the soft tissue on the other side of the bone. Now I completed my osteotomy and I removed the extra bone. I put my plate back again. I fill the top holes uh, with the screws that I've taken out already. Should be very quick. Reading the uh, video. For the sake of time and when I put the top screws I don't drive it fully uh, I do the other screws so that they can sit nicely on the bone the proximal screw usually I use cancellous screw while the others are cortical if you notice that I put my plate very high on the flare of the greater trochanter the reason why, because putting straight plate on the greater trochanter, it will give you various about 15 degrees, as I show in this diagram, which is an advantageous. Once we are happy with the proximal fixation, we put the two ends together and hold them with the bone. Hold the clamp and try to fix the distal fragment. It's really important uh, to get the alignment correct. So we need the rotation is good as is seen in this picture and uh, as well from the picture inside. So we get the rotation right. We get the x-rays to make sure that the metal were in the right place and the screw length has are correct, both in the AP and the lateral. After that, we'll, uh, we'll wash the wound then we start our closure. Uh, it's important really to put the vastus lateralis where it comes from and spend good uh, length of time to repair adequately.
Now after completion of the thigh wound, we turn our attention to the hip. We give another wash again to prepare for the capsulography. Uh, the capsulography is going to be TNV capsulography. This is a small diagram to explain what the TNV uh, capsulography means. So the top part attached to the bottom part to give this V shape. So converting what is T capsular to me into V capsulography. After I put my sutures in the capsule and before I reduce the joint, I do what I call it the open orthogram, uh, which uh, I put a few drops of omnipec bake inside the joint, then reduce the joint, give a bit of shake and uh, move it around to spread the dye on the head. Then I'll take some pictures. This will give me a nice contra contrast for the head to see how nice it is sitting within the joint. And as you can see, there's an, uh, the head is sitting nicely in the socket with, this, with no medial pulling at all. After that, I reduce the joint and I close my capsule. Uh, I usually use uh, ethipone sutures, uh, number two or number three. When I finish uh, capsule closure, I'll start doing my osteotomy. Uh, my preferred osteotomy is Pemberton osteotomy. It has many advantages. Uh, it is uh, it, uh, it will provide better coverage anterior and laterally, and you can tailor how much you want uh, coverage with anterior or lateral. It doesn't need any metal wire to keep it, so there's no second operation to remove the metal wire. So it has many advantages, and it's easy to do. Uh, this diagram is from your book. Uh, it depicts how a uh, Pemberton osteotomy is made. You have to cut the pelvic bone above the anterior superior iliac spine from both sides, inside and outside. However, it doesn't reach the posterior wall uh, or the greater sciatic notch because if it does, this will become like a uh, salter osteotomy. And because it relies on the elasticity of the bone, when you put the bone in graft, usually the bone in graft is stable. With Pemberton osteotomy, uh, the bony cut started on the outside uh, of the iliac bone, around a centimeter or so above the estabular ridge. It goes all the way to the uh, inner table, but don't cut the inner table at this stage. Uh, and you, you curve all around the estabulum at the front. Uh, anterior and uh, in the middle superior and at the back posterior but it does not reach the greater sciatic notch once you complete the outside cut then you start in, uh, cutting from uh, the front I would like to emphasize at this stage we are really cutting just the outer co uh, cortex we are not breaching to the medial cortex I'm speeding the video here uh, because this process can take a few minutes. Uh, take your time. It takes as long as it takes, as long as you cut the outer cortex around the estabulum and don't breach the inside or the posterior column. Uh, two observation. As you can see, as we start doing the osteotomy, there will be more bleeding uh, because this is a cancellous bone and they usually ooze significantly. Uh, the second thing, all these cutting, we just need the AP view on the CR. Here I almost finished the lateral wall cut, and uh, now I come from the front uh, with relatively wide osteotome. Uh, outer side of the osteotome sitting in my initial cut while the inside it is just breaching through the cortex so this will give you a better control on the fragment so I go down uh, somewhere in the middle I might need to tilt my osteotome to break it through the inner wall 
of course this cannot be done blindly you need some x-ray control also technically can be done without x-ray but i prefer to use the x-ray and here you need to tilt your c arm around 45 degrees to see the posterior column because you need your osteotome to go exactly in the middle of the posterior column still rigid cannot open so i'm free more at the back and on the inside so i follow with my osteotome the curve of the uh, socket or the curve of the acetabulum and i can see it uh, with the x-ray uh, here you need to develop some three-dimensional orientation uh, because a uh, body cut at the front and the back of the acetabulum when you look at the x-ray the uh, ap x-ray it looks as if it is going inside the socket However, if you tilt your C arm around 45 degrees uh, to see the posterior wall, you can see actually you are in front and at the back of the uh, acetabulum rather than inside the acetabulum. More bone to cut here. And as you can see, I am uh, trying to uh, go more posterior. Uh, ideally we should leave uh, a centimeter to half centimeter away from the posterior column as you can start uh, see to start moving now the distal fragment is more mobile you can see i use my finger a lot actually i'm feeling where my osteotomy is going uh, in relation to the bone and here I can feel that the osteotome is still short at the back, so I'm extending at the back. And the more I extend my osteotomy, the more the distal fragment become mobile. Here, uh, particularly at the last uh, centimeter or so, you have to be careful because you don't want to break through the posterior column. Even if you do break, it's not the end of the world, it becomes a solter, but you have to stabilize it and we try to avoid that now i use my laminar separator and i open my osteotomy it seems to be reasonably opening again do it uh, gradually respect the bone elasticity you don't want to put it to do it too fast and so break the posterior column Here I'm feeling with my osteotome or even McDonald you can use for where my osteotomy stop. And I'm confident that it has not to break through and I have a reasonable elasticity to keep my bone graft in a place. Uh, I open my osteotomy gradually and check with the x-ray for the amount of uh, coverage uh, and the correction I get. If I need more, I'll give it some time, then I'll open it further till I receive till I reach a stage where I'm happy. Once I'm happy with the final position, I, I'll measure the gap in my osteotomy. Usually it is a centimeter to one finger breadth. Uh, then I will harvest my uh, bone graft. I usually use a uh, oscillating uh, saw. And I cut uh, a reasonable amount, which is matching the amount of bone graft I need. Once I harvested the bone graft, I usually clean it from any remnant epiphysis, then I impact it in, at the oste uh, osteotomy site. Again, this step should be uh, done carefully. Once you wedge the, uh, the graft into the osteotomy, it will make the laminar separator loose and you can take it off. Then you impact the graft further using uh, a hammer and uh, uh, impactor. As you can see, I'm using a punch and a hammer to try to drive it a bit further down. 
inside the osteotomy. This is further open the osteotomy as well. But it has to be done in a controlled way so that you want to break through the posterior column. And now the graft seem to be sitting nicely within the osteotomy. It looks stable. You can test it further using uh, coca. Uh, and normally it doesn't need any further stabilization. However, I've added one more step to Pemberton osteotomy. Uh, it is really simple, doesn't take long time. Just making two holes in the pelvic osteotomy, one in the graft, one in the pelvis, and you suture it to further stabilize the front of the graft. Uh, this has not been described by Pemberton, but it is my addition for the procedure. It just makes me feel more confident about the stability of my graft. Here, as you can see, I use a tip bone suture to further stabilize the graft. And again, I re-emphasis, this is my addition for the Merperton osteotomy, and you don't have to do it. Uh, just give me more confidence about my uh, graft is not going to dislodge. Uh, one suture at the bottom and one suture at the top. And it does not add a lot to the procedure, maybe five minutes max. And before we close the wound, we take the final x-ray to make sure everything in the right place and the amount of coverage and correction is reasonable. I'm happy with this x-ray, seem I achieved what I wanted to achieve. Then I started closing the wound. First I closed the physis uh, in the same fashion we did in the previous videos, which is one loop around the epiphysis and one through it and try to bring them in a nicely opposed way. The first suture is usually important because it will set the ground for the uh, for subsequent sutures. And if you close the first uh, suture very well, usually the rest of the epiphysis is closed nicely. Here I think the suture has been tangled a bit and we managed to untangle it. And second suture usually a centimeter apart on, on average they take four to five sutures to close the whole epiphysis we're not going to show it all in this video because we've shown it in previous videos then the next layer we close the next layer which is the, uh, uh, the muscles that peeled off the epiphysis I'm speeding the video here for the sake of time and here I use uh, number one micro 
when I complete this layer, I will close the fat and the skin. Here I'm doing the final subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous layer, then this will be followed by subcutaneous and I use a 4O or 5O monocrylic for the skin. Uh, after I finish, uh, most of these patients have caudal so I don't need to put local anesthesia. Uh, but I use sterile strips and uh, Mapilex dressing to cover the wound. Uh, then after that we'll position the patient uh, for hepispica. Unfortunately, the video from this patient was a bit corrupted, so we use another patient video to demonstrate this part. Having finished the surgery, I really want to ensure uh, that the hip stay in, in uh, place uh, during the spike application. So as you can see, I'm holding the hip in the uh, position uh, while my plaster technician applying the stockinette and we have to work as a team. He should not push me or he should not dislocate the hip as he apply his stock in it. Uh, and also I allow him to do his job. Uh, this part usually uh, uh, performed while the patient is still on the operating uh, table, which means not on the spiker table. So we put all the stock in it before we transfer the patient to the uh, hip spiker table. After upper reduction, the spike we apply usually one and a half, which means one full leg on the on the operating side and half of the leg on the other side. And the position of the operating limb usually it is 30, 30, 30, which means 30 degrees of hip flexion, 30 degrees of hip abduction, and 30 degrees of internal rotation on average. If it needs more than 30 degrees of internal rotation, probably worth doing a femoral osteotomy. And here we are applying the short stock in it on the other limb. For the sake of time, I'll try to speed the videos when the process is routine and not important, but I slow it down when there are key uh, stages. Here, now we completed putting the stock in it, so we're going to transfer the baby to the hip spike. Again, this is really a teamwork, and we practiced it a lot uh, before we starting the service. Uh, so we allocate each team member to certain part of the body or certain tasks to do. My job as a surgeon, I usually keep the hip reduced in the correct position. So you can see one of my right limb on the leg and my left uh, hand on the pelvis. So now my team is assembling around the child and getting the spiker table ready. We normally use an uh, orthopediatric spiker table, which is uh, shown here. And once the patient, once we are ready as a team, we lift the patient up. And we put the box first, then we put the patient back, then we put the lower part of the spiker table. And my blaster technician here tried to uh, put the stock in it around the bar that hold the lower part of the body. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous videos that uh, putting a spiker is not difficult. However, putting a very good hip spiker needs uh, paying attention to the details. Here, as you can see, he's uh, doing a lot of work at the back, now moving the baby down 
to the bottom part of the hip spike. Uh, during this process, the surgeon needs to remain focused on the hip. As you can see, I'm holding the hip between all these maneuvers. And while I'm allowing my plastic technician to navigate around me, uh, I'm ensuring that he does not dislocate the hip. Uh, once the baby is secured on the spiker table, uh, the plastic technician focus on his uh, spiker. He ensures that the stockinette cover all the important areas, ensure they are not too tight and there are no creases. During this procedure, uh, the surgeon really remain focused on the hip and should involve minimally in the spiker itself. That's why it really is important to have uh, a well-trained well -trained plastic technician to do the hip spiker. Sometime during this process, the child might be tilted to one side, so it needs readjustment. Uh, also, the bear hugger, as you can see, we need to keep the baby warm during this procedure. Uh, here, uh, the plaster technician put a spacer between the stockinette and between the belly. This to allow for uh, the belly to be expanded later when the child has food or drink. Uh, more tidying up of the stockinette and the position of the baby from front side and from behind as well. And uh, now uh, uh, the next layer which is the soft roll. The soft roll route around the belly so that the, usually the soft roll extend way beyond the spiker area so that later we can fold it back to cover the edges of the spiker well. Uh, at the front, as you can see, uh, it is way above the belly button, which is the upper end of the spiker. Uh, but at the side at the back, it reaches well above the rib cages. Uh, usually, in, in my spiker, at the front is at the belly button, but it curved on, on along the side to rest of the rib cages, and at the back slightly higher. And now a uh, soft roll for the lower limbs. You can see the hip is uh, flex around 30 degrees, abducted around 30 degrees, and there's interrotation of around 30 degrees as well. A uh, soft rolls for the lower limbs as well. And again, uh, they extend beyond where the spiker ex is expected to, to end. Here on the side, you can see it's covering almost the knee, although the spike will be uh, slightly above the knee. Final adjustment before we start casting. And here we start uh, casting. I usually use a scotch. Uh, as you can see, we start from the torso, from the body. And at the front, it is uh, below the belly button but it's curved upward to be resting on the rib cages on the side and slightly higher at the back. And the distance away from the groin or away from the private part uh, varies whether it is open or closed reduction. In open reduction, usually the hip is more stable, so I allow longer distances, more than two finger breath. It's important really to work as a, a team with the plaster technician. Uh, the surgeon allows the plaster technician to do his job uh, by moving his hand around his uh, area of work, but at the same time keeping the hip reduced. If you have the same plaster technician, usually after a few cases this will become harmonious and seem to be, it looks very natural. And as you can see that we've done the right side first, 
because this is a side we operated and we need to secure as early as possible and then we move to do the other side the other side it's not full it is just uh, above the knee and it's the same amount of uh, hip flexion and abduction however the rotation is not important because it will rotate uh, without extending below the knee you cannot control the rotation and now the main bulk of the spike has been completed and uh, the next layer is really to strengthen the weak area of the spike or the vulnerable area of the spike and this is included the junction between the body part and the limbs here we use what we call the focus rigidity which is a few layers of the cast uh, wrap around the back and coming on either limb this is to make this vulnerable area stronger Once the strengthening part has been applied, then the final uh, color uh, will be uh, added. Uh, this child uh, or her parent used this color or preferred this color and we try to use it for you. This is usually make the children happy. Now we have reached the final stage of the spike, which is uh, tidying up the edges and the final plaster. Here we roll the soft roll a few layers to make it cover the edges very well. Uh, this is usual if you don't do this very well, it can be uh, a bit abrasive to the skin. So we give it good attention. Again, on the top part of the spike as well. I think with this child I noted that the spike is not going high enough on the side and at the back. So I asked uh, my plaster technician to extend it a bit more on the side or on the back. And we have to get the spike perfect. Okay. Because it will be really difficult to do any adjustment on the wall. The child will be upset, the parent will be upset. Okay. So here we add uh, more soft roll to the front uh, and the back and uh, plan again at the front remain the same no more extension because it is at the belly button it is just the back and the side and I'm glad this happened because it will show uh, uh, the nice curve of the spike See at the front it is uh, quite low but at the side and the back uh, it is high uh, my personal thought is that a uh, low spike uh, works well if it is rest on the rib cage and at the uh, back of the spine uh, and you can go at the front as low as the belly button this will help the child to sit better but at the same time maintaining the good immobilization of the hip uh, some colleagues use a different level for the extension of their spike uh, some use the nibble line as the upper limit of the spike some use the zipper sternum uh, my personal i believe uh, the spike i've shown you is a good compromise between comfort for the child being at the belly button to allow him to sit more comfortably uh, but also being extended on the side to the rib cage and the back it will uh, provide enough immobilization for the head and so far i never had any problem with that and this will bring us to the end of our video. 
uh, it was long video because it covers a few operations uh, but i hope we make it as simple as possible it will help you in the, for your exam and for your practice and let's wish you all the best for your exam